please join me in the invocation as we pray together. As we gather today, O God, fill our hearts with gratitude for life. Fill our minds with dreams for a better world. Fill our eyes with your vision for all that you would have us to be. Grant us strength to be faithful as you are faithful. These things we pray in the name of our Lord, who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. (laughs) Beloved, God receives all that we are, and seeks to make us all that we can be by God's mercy. Thanks be to God. Others of you are seated, we would like to ask our veterans to remain standing for the responsive reading. I want to thank all of our veterans. It's a privilege for me as a fellow veteran to read our responsive reading today. This house of worship is open today. Because of the sacrifice of men and women who gave themselves. The freedom of worship is ours today because of the sacrifice that some made to help secure that freedom for all. The gratitude of our congregation is expressed today because in their acts of service to our country, some gave all and all gave something. Thanks be to God for those who offer sacrificial service that we might be free. Amen. My fellow veterans can be seated. It is our privilege today to be able to play a part in the entry into the family of God of Emmett Austin Parks and Sienna Grace Pellegrino. As you often hear, these two families who come today to receive the act of baptism and welcome into the community of faith have been here before and have celebrated a number of significant events in their respective lives with this congregation. There have been weddings and baptisms and memorial services and all sorts of things that have been important to each family, and they've been celebrated right here among us. God gives us a great privilege to share in these lives in this way. I want to invite Emmett and Sienna now to bring their parents to the waters of baptism. This is Emmett Austin Parks, and I'd like to invite Emmett's family and friends to stand now in recognition of the fact, Emmett, that it's not just your mom and dad who will make your life all that it should be, but it's this group of people who join with them 
to see that you grow in wisdom and in faith and in favor with God and humankind. And I'd like to invite the Pellegrino family to stand. And Sienna, I'd like for you to see that it's not just your mom and dad, but it's all of these people who will join with them in helping you to grow in wisdom and knowledge and faith. And now I'd like to ask our membership to stand. And I want both of you, Emmett and Sienna, to see that it's all of these people who want to be a part of your faith journey. They want to help you gain the knowledge that you need. They want to help you grow in the faith that you have. They want to welcome you to this place of faith as a child of God and a member of the family of God. You may all be seated. And now Emmett Austin Parks, because of the faith of these people and your parents and because of their desire that you be a part of the family of God, I baptize you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. And Sienna Grace, because of the faith of your family, because of the faith of these people, I baptize you now in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. May the grace of God be with you both. May the goodness of God fill you both. May the wisdom of God guide you each day of your journey of life. Amen. Amen. <laughs>
We are the people of God. Thank you, choir, for leading us in worship this morning. Our hymn is number 572, America the Beautiful. Hymn number 572. Please remain seated as we read from Scripture for our Gospel reading from the book of Matthew, chapter 25, verses 1 through 13. Then the kingdom of heaven will be like this. Ten bridesmaids took their lamps and went to meet the bridegroom. Five of them were foolish and five were wise. When the foolish took their lamps, they took no oil with them, but the wise took flasks of oil with their lamps. As the bridegroom was delayed, all of them became drowsy and slept. But at midnight there was a shout, Look, here is the bridegroom. Come out to meet him. Then all those 
got up and trimmed their lamps. The foolish said to the wise, Give us some of your oil, for our lamps are going out. But the wise replied, No, there will not be enough for you and for us. You had better go to the dealers and buy some for yourselves. And while they went to buy it, the bridegroom came. And those who were ready went with him into the wedding banquet, and the door was shut. Later, the other bridesmaids came also, saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. But he replied, Truly, I tell you, I do not know you. Keep awake, therefore, for you know neither the day nor the hour. The word of the Lord. I have a confession to make. I do not like today's biblical text. I don't like it at all. Because it seems to reward the arbitrary and capricious decision of a bridegroom to show up just whenever he wants to. It also seems to reward the stinginess of some people who probably have more than enough but don't wish to share. And it seems to punish a group that only does what any of us would logically do when facing the circumstances they were facing. So I don't like today's biblical text, and that's why I resorted to the math lesson that you see as the sermon title, 5 plus 5 equals the kingdom of heaven. Because I don't think that Jesus set this text out to be taken at face value. Now, far be it from me to speak for Jesus, but the good rabbi that he was, I think he probably set this story out as a story for those around him to wrestle with, to learn from, to find something better than the end of this story promises when we read it. I also don't like the most common interpretations that come of this text. If you come from the evangelistic, revivalistic tradition in which I grew up, this is often the text that the revival preacher will pull out on Friday night to offer the hottest sermon to scare the most people into the kingdom of heaven that he can possibly do so. It's often interpreted as a be ready kind of thing. And while I don't think that's a bad message for people... I don't think that's the message that this text best conveys. I've also heard this interpreted as a word of encouragement, sort of a backhanded word of encouragement, if you will, that basically takes those who are considered unprepared and says, don't be foolish like these people are foolish. And while that might, again, be a lesson that we would want to learn, I'm not sure it's the lesson that this text and this story teach best. So what do we do with this story? How do we interpret this text in a way that makes a difference in the world in which we live? In a way that makes a difference in the lives that we lead and how we treat our neighbors? Well, since I'm going to take away the traditional interpretations and give you a math lesson, let me offer this as a possible interpretation of what I think Jesus was trying to do among his listeners, and at least a lesson that I think we can take from this day that will help us to live more faithfully the faith we proclaim. I think this text is best interpreted as a reminder to us that the kingdom of heaven, also alternately called the kingdom of God, begins here and now, and is not just in the sweet by and by somewhere out in the future. If you'll remember, Jesus himself said that in him the kingdom was present. Now, the fullness of the kingdom may be yet to come, But the kingdom is here and now. And because the kingdom is here and now, 
it's also important to remember that the kingdom of heaven includes all kinds of people, both those who are overprepared and also some of those who are unprepared. And the love of God and the mercy of God and the goodness of God calls those of us who overprepare to have mercy on those who are not quite as prepared as we think they ought to be. I think also that the passage seeks to remind us that the kingdom of heaven is a place where, yes, preparation is important. But what's more important is our presence at significant events like bridal party coming out where there's going to be a big wedding and a big festival. More important than being prepared for it is simply being present, being there, offering that person your life and your support. I think it's also a reminder that Sometimes preparation is overdone. What if those who were so concerned about having enough oil, who were by most interpretations unprepared, had simply realized that there would be plenty of light inside at the party and waited in the darkness until they could get into the light? What if they had stayed there and been able to share in this time of celebration. I think the kingdom of heaven would have us remember that our presence is more important than our preparation and that the love of our neighbor is more important than being prepared for everything in a perfect sort of way. I don't know that this is what Jesus would have us do with this passage, but I think it's at least a message that we can take from this place and use to make our world a better place. I think it's at least a message that we need not forget and that we be reminded of how important it is for us to simply be present at significant events and for us to simply act as a neighbor toward our neighbor when we have opportunity. Yeah, I think Jesus was really offering a message to those who would listen and to us to be aware of what was around them. To not lose focus in the details of life so much so that you miss the point of living altogether. That's what happened, it seems, in this story. Everybody was so concerned about the details and rushing around and making sure they had enough, whether anybody else had enough or not, that the party was diminished by the absence of those who were thought unprepared. So I think Jesus would say, be aware. Don't lose focus in the details. Don't lose focus, I think Jesus would say, fretting about the darkness. The truth is that darkness will be a part of our human journey from now until we get to the completed kingdom of heaven on the other side of eternity. Darkness is something we will have to deal with. And we are promised light to overcome the darkness. So I think Jesus would say, be aware. Don't lose focus over fretting about the darkness. And I think Jesus would say, be aware. Don't lose focus by forgetting to care for your neighbor. Don't lose focus by leaving somebody out who you could help include in the celebration. Don't become so concerned about your own presence there that you diminish the party by allowing others to be left out of the party. Now again, I don't know if this helps this text much or not, and I don't know that you would necessarily agree with my take on it, but I've wrestled with it as I think Jesus intended us to wrestle with it. 
And I've come away with the conclusion that the best thing we can do about this text is to remember how important it is for us to be present and to remember how important it is for us to love our neighbor in every way we possibly can. And by doing those two things, to serve God well and help God gain a good reputation in our world, which will be made better by our focus on presence and love of neighbor. May God give us the grace to be a people who are present and to be a people who at all costs will seek to love our neighbor and remember that the kingdom of heaven is five plus five. And anything less than that is a diminishment that we shouldn't stand for. Amen. We come to this place in our service to receive an offering. May God bless the gifts you brought to give this day.
gracious God, loving Father, creator and sustainer of us all, we join our hearts in prayer to give thanks for your goodness. We pray that our gifts would reflect that goodness. We pray that our gifts would make our, their way into the world to extend that goodness. We give thanks today, O oh God, for the veterans that we have celebrated. And we give thanks for those who continue to serve on our behalf throughout the world to bring peace this day and to help keep peace in regions where that is a difficult task. We ask your blessing and your mercy be upon them. We give thanks today, God, for the Parks family and for the part that we've had in Emmett's life this day. And we pray your blessing upon Emmett. We give thanks for the Pellegrino family and for the part that we were able to play in Sienna's life today. And we pray your continued blessing upon Sienna and her family. We pray that they might always find this family of God to be a welcoming and open place for them. We ask today, Father, that your grace and mercy be with Gail and Mike McCormick as they mourn the loss of her mom, Jean Rogers. We pray today for Paul and Olivia Karras as they face health issues. We pray for Russ as he is struggling with health. We pray today for Stephen that you might bless and give him safekeeping and well-being. We pray today for Sprite, that grace and mercy might be extended to her. We pray today for Bill and Kathleen as they walk through a time of hospice care and cancer. We pray today for Verna as she faces surgery on Tuesday. We pray today for Ellen and Ron who are dealing with cancer we pray for Ken that you would grant him comfort and mercy as he continues a difficult journey. We pray today for Carl that you would be with him and grant him what he needs in his time of need. All of these, Lord, we know are meaningful to you. All of these can be recipients of your mercy. All of these can be recipients of your grace. And for that, we pray. Help us, O oh Lord, where we have opportunity to offer ourselves as your presence in the midst of these needs. Help us, Lord, to have your vision for our world. These things we pray in the name of Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen.